Hello again and welcome to Adventures with P. I'm P and on today's adventure I'm going to be showing you the method that I use to take a raw deer hide like this and transform it into a beautiful piece of workable fabric that we can use to make arts and craft and maybe even some type of clothing. So stay tuned as you learn my method and hopefully have a whole lot of fun along the way. I think our ancestors were definitely onto something when they chose to let Mother Nature take care of their needs and see how far Mother Nature could actually provide for them with natural materials like a deer hide. And they were able to use a deer hide to help them with a multitude of survival and thrival tasks. Uh, for one, in days where it's cold like this, they were able to preserve a deer hide with the fur on and actually provide for some additional warmth. Now, it doesn't sound like a whole lot, but if you think about it, that's what allowed us as homo sapiens to shed our body hair and actually proceed into colder climates in search of hunting grounds and other places to form habitats. So it's largely beneficial. And when making buckskin, which is what we're gonna be doing today, when making buckskin out of these deer hides as well, you're gonna find out that there's a whole lot of different applications that this single fabric can actually provide for us. The process of making buckskin varies widely between different regions of the world and even different tribes within certain regions. And kind of grouping things together, there really is no wrong way of making buckskin, which is a good, uh, kind of a good news story for those who are actually afraid to, to give this process uh, a shot because all you can really do is make a preserved hide um, free of hair and it's going to be of varying stiffnesses but it is still a usable fabric. Um, I'll, I'll show you a few things that I have which we use this for arts and crafts or even other various applications. Oh, to me. And what I have here is a buckskin pouch that actually holds a mini Bic lighter. This stays with me everywhere I go. Anytime I leave the house, it is always by me. And that way I know that I'll always have some sort of method for starting a fire. Kinds of things. This holster right here, the sheath, which actually houses uh, this little skinny knife is made out of buckskin. And it's tanned and it's preserved. We also use buckskin for making, um, making some sort of pouches. Now this is an elaborate pouch, which on the back side is buckskin. And on the front side is actually a tanned squirrel hide. I got a bunch of these suckers in my yard, so I'm always trying to make stuff with them. And it doesn't even have to be something as elaborate as this. Something as simple as just a pouch made out of buckskin as well to, to house anything that you want to protect or keep in one place. And this right here is where I house my flint and steel kit um, in case I decide I want to go a little nostalgic and just start a fire using my striker rod and, and a, um, a piece of chert or flint. So this material has a whole bunch of applications to it. Buckskin is a very interesting fabric to work with and it has a lot of unique characteristics. For starters, you can customize it to as soft as you want, as pliable as you want, or as hard and as stiff Damn. as you want. You can make it so that it's just soft and it's pliable and it's, it's durable and stretchy and it's gonna be something comfortable to wear. Even now in this state, it's kind of a sensory material here where I can just have it in my hands and it feels soft and uh, I guess for lack of a better word, it feels comfortable and inviting. Um, so I probably would look forward to rocking a pair of maybe moccasins, house slippers out of something like this in the future. 
If what you're looking for is something a little bit more rugged, you could absolutely do that as well. There are thicker parts on the deer to include the neck and the hide where it is just a, a stiffer, or the neck and the rump, where it is a stiffer um, type of material here and you can hear that. It's not as pliable or as soft as some of the other areas when you get around to the belly or the shoulders. And this makes a wonderful material for some sort of a pouch if you're looking to have a, a belt pouch and you can actually form it around a mold, get it wet, and when it, when it dries, it'll hold to the shape of the mold. And people will use that, especially if you're an outdoorsman or maybe a frontiersman reenactor, you can use something like that to hold your lead shot for your muzzle loaders or your Hawkins traditional rifles and things like that. And it's a wonderful material that'll keep things in place whenever you're moving around. When it comes to making buckskin, the process is relatively simple. It's not easy, but it is simple, and it really only requires a very minimal amount of tools. For starters, you have a fleshing beam, and this is nothing more than just a log that is suspended with some 2x4s. You'll need some sort of tool for fleshing and removing hair, and we have a fleshing knife. These come in all different types of shapes and sizes, and you could probably even get away with just some sort of a metal scraper. There are modified scrapers that people use to include things like putty knives, and those will work as well. They're just not as effective. And last but not least, really what you need is just some sort of protection uh, to protect your clothes from some of the bodily fluids that come off of the deer, uh, the different fats and fluids. And for that, I have just a simple apron. Now, there are waterproof aprons that are special designed for this, but I've been using this uh, cotton type of a canvas apron, and it works well for what I need. I guess it goes without saying that the first thing that you want to do is catch yourself a deer. I promise you that the deer wants that hide more than you do. So in many ways, that is going to be the hardest part about that. But after you get the deer, you're going to want to wind up fleshing it. And here's how we do that. So when you get the deer and you wind up hide, uh, taking the hide off of the deer, it's going to be very tempting to want to flesh it as you are winding up removing the hide. I'm going to caution you against that because if you are winding up taking your knife, it's very easy to slip that knife as you're trying to remove the hide and actually wind up cutting into the hide that you want to wind up preserving. So it's a lot easier to do that with a purpose-built fleshing knife. So don't be too worried about removing all the little bits and stuff off of your deer, let the fleshing knife do that during this process. This is a knife that has a distinct bevel to it, but it's very dull and it's designed to scrape away any of these flesh and fatty fragments from the hide, the underside of the hide, and not necessarily cut. So it's a lot safer in preserving the hide that you want to work with later. And it's very easy to do that you're going to start here by getting under that layer and just pushing it away. Posture is a big thing here. You want to make sure that your fleshing beam is at a, a height that is going to be comfortable for you. And for me, getting it right around my navel area, around my belly button, is a comfortable position for me to be in. If you find that you're bent over way too far you're going to get a lot of pain in your back or if you're up too high you're not going to be able to pinch the hide against your flesh and beam and that's what you want to do to keep it from rolling and moving on you as you continue to flesh the hide so i just kind of get on my toenail my tippy toes here and i lean up over it and i sink down to my my heels and at that point i know that the hide is good and locked in and i'm just going to go ahead and take this fleshing knife and just get under the layers of that connective tissue and remove any of that tallow 
and any of the, uh, the meat that may not have been cut away during the skinning process. And it really is that simple. And you just continue to, to work the hide in this downward fashion. And, and don't be afraid to really put some muscle into it because, like I said, it is a very, very resilient um, fabric here, a very resilient material that you're going to be working with. And having a dull flesh knife really prevents you from cutting into it. So I'm just going to keep going into this. It also helps to have some type of container that as you wind up fleshing and removing some of these bits, you can just throw stuff into it. So I'm not going to talk my way through this. I'm just going to work and we'll keep the cameras rolling. And just like that, most of it has come off. And what we're gonna do here is just kind of work our way around the edges um, to make sure that we can get any remnants off. The cleaner that you can get your hide at this point by fleshing it and not cutting into it, the better and more supple and pliable it's gonna be because it's clearing that fat and it's going to make way for absorbing some of the tanning solutions that we're going to get into it a little bit later. So I'm just going to continue to work my way around here and um, hopefully it'll be done here very shortly. I am running out of So for right now we are done with everything that we need to do tonight. We have completely fleshed out this hide and tomorrow we're moving on to step two which is going to be removing the fur from this side. So stay tuned and it's going to be <laughs> a lot more work. Good morning everyone. Yesterday we had left off with a fully fleshed out hide. We removed all the little connective tissue, the flesh and any fat from this side of the hide. Today we need to get our hide ready for its tanning solution bath. And that process is known as scraping. By and large, hides are scraped into two different manners. They use a wet scrape or a dry scrape. I'll let you look it up. They are two distinctively different ways of scraping the hide and each have their own pros and cons. But we're gonna go with a dry scrape today because it gets us to the finished product a little bit faster and I want to do this outside. The weather looks like it's going to be colder and a little bit more snowy as we move into the week. So I want to be able to knock this out now while we have a good opportunity. But before I do that, I want to show you all this neat little uh, bone that I found after cleaning out this deer downstairs. This is a scapula and it kind of was the original fleshing tool back in the day. The Native Americans would use it to scrape out their hide as well as remove the fur. And in addition to this, they also had a shin bone that they would use and kind of push uh, the fur down just like they would in a fleshing knife. So I thought it was pretty interesting to show you this. Let's get into taking the fur off this hide. The process of scraping is really no different than the process of fleshing. You want to start at the neck and work your way down to the tail and kind of go with the direction of the fur. Now, unlike fleshing where the, where the uh, connective tissue wants to separate from the, uh, from the hide, scraping is not so easy. The uh, dermis layer, which is the top layer of skin, actually designed to hold onto the hair really tight. 
So you have to get under it and it does take some oomph and I'm not holding back here um, when I'm pushing into it. And after you kind of get a clean start, it's easier to get it going, but it does take some time to get it started. And right now, I'm not having the best of luck. I'm kind of wishing that maybe I did do a, a wet scrape here. Let's see. Whew. You can see here that we got it started and it goes a little bit easier now that we got it started. And it every hide kind of has its own feel and you just got to develop that feel to see how your hide wants to be scraped. A little bit of a safety note here. You can see that, I don't, I don't know if the camera will pick this up, but that is actually a deer tick here. And as I continue to scrape the hide, I'm actually finding quite a bit of these ticks. Now for safety purposes, it's always good to freeze your hide uh, to kill off any ticks that are on them before you start working them. Deer ticks carry. So just like with fleshing, you really have to put some effort into removing the hair, but more importantly, that dermis layer under it, which is what connects the hair to the hide. If you don't. So this is a great example of what you're trying to achieve. This right now is raw hide, and this is gonna be ready to accept your tanning solution. All this right here, where it's a little bit different in color, that is your dermis layer, and that is what you need to remove along with the hair. If you just remove the hair and leave the dermis layer, you'll have more of a leather, and that's gonna be great. Like I was saying, you can customize this material for more of the hardcore, heavy-duty stuff. And if that's what you need, just leave that dermis layer on and you have leather. But if you want something soft and supple, and something that's gonna be wearable and comfortable, you need to remove that dermis layer from your buckskin so that way it can accept that tanning solution. Behind your strokes here, these short little strokes go a long way in removing the hair, but you also want to be careful to make sure that you're not gonna cut into your buckskin. A couple of things to that you can do that will help prevent that from happening is first and foremost you want to make sure that your flesh and beam is smooth. Any massive protrusions that stick up from the underside here serve, serve as a potential point where your knife can really catch it and just kind of uh, rupture the hide that you're trying to work on. Another thing as well is you, you want to prevent your blade, your fleshing tool, from slipping. So don't slice it here you can push down a certain angle but you definitely don't want to slice because slicing can also uh, form a potential weak spot and obviously rupture the hide that you're working so hard on so these are just some tools here and if you're following those rules go to town make sure that you get all that dermis layer off and it's just a whole lot of elbow grease Now towards the ends, once you get toward any of the edges, that's where I find that I have the most trouble. And um, I can, it's easy just to go ahead and, and rip through and take some of that skin with you or some of the hide with you. And then you're kind of left with um, bits of unusable buckskin towards the end. So I'm going to be careful not to do that. I'm just going to take my time here as I get towards the end, towards these edges. And maybe, oh, see, like I did it right there. I just want to put a hole right through there. So not bad. It's kind of expected when you get to the edges here, but I'm going to see if I can not do that from now on. We'll see.
You know that old antage where hindsight is 2020. If I knew how much this hide didn't want to give up the fur, I would have made a rug. I often get the feeling that this kind of stuff is really in our DNA. And uh, we've gotten so far away from it that people are willing to, you know, pay money to go to these folk schools to kind of reconnect with it. We've had this error era of uh, convenience at the push of your fingertips and McDonald's and cushy cushy and we've you think with all that we'd have the most happiest society on record but that doesn't seem to be what the evidence is supporting we have depression that is skyrocketing and you know we're seeing things that we've not seen before active shooter scenarios teen suicides and I think that the complexities and all these convenience that the modern world offers comes at a cost and it's kind of the cost of really losing what it was to be at a very to be human at a very visceral level there's some level of suffering that has to happen for us to be happy. It's that yin and yang. You have to have it. And with all our tech cloth and these amazing manufacturing processes, you can have clothes that are going to be amazing to wear. And they're going to be the most comfortable clothes in the world. But when, you're, when you've used them a couple times and it's kind of lost its novelty... You just discard them. And I don't think that's ever been the case with buckskin. I think if somebody puts so much time and effort into making a pair of pants out of buckskin, it doesn't matter if it's not new anymore. They're not out trying to go ahead and get the latest and greatest buckskin fashion. They're just content with wearing what they have because they remember what it was to make it and I think long after it's outlived its usefulness let's say if this was to become pants long after it's lived its usefulness and it's just full of holes hell maybe it doesn't even fit anymore I bet you the person who owns these pants are going to be reluctant to get rid of them and even if he never or she never wears them again I bet you just looking at these pants will bring that person joy. So I think, I guess to get into my philosophy, you can't have happiness and convenience not in a lasting sense. I think one suffers for the other. And maybe if we were to get back to this, not even just to preserve the art of doing this, but just to get back to a more simple type of existence. I think it will remind people of that. We'll see. That's my philosophy. Who knows? Maybe I could uh, have enough, enough buckskin here to make something comfortable and just hate it. And just give it away. <laughs> but... Uh, but for right now, I'm kind of enjoying the process. I guess we'll we'll get to that bridge when we cross. We'll cross that bridge when we get there. And just like that, after eight hours of hunching over your flesh and beam and working it with your knife, we have a piece of rawhide, not buckskin yet. To turn this into buckskin, we actually have to soak it in a tanning solution, and we're going to do that now. Now that we've effectively stripped the hide from all of its fur and all of its flesh, we need to create a tanning solution that we can start soaking that hide in. And this step is critically important because that's what gives our finished product the soft suppleness of buckskin. 
There's a bunch of different methods that people use to create a tannin solution. I've heard of people taking a bunch of eggs and using that. I've heard of other people using vegetable oils and some other vegetable-based products to create a tannin solution. And there's a whole plethora of off-the-shelf products that you can use, like this one right here, uh, that promises a nice suede finish. And today, we're gonna use none of these. We're gonna kick it old school today and do a process that probably was one of the first tanning methods. And that is taking the brain from the hide that this, or from the animal that this hide came from and using that brain to make a tanning solution. Here's my disclaimer. If you are squeamish, I'm probably gonna put a box here with some information to tell you how far ahead you should jump your video so you don't have to see any of this stuff. But if you're interested to see my method, stick around. Now it goes without saying, if you're gonna make a brain tanning solution, the first thing you need is the deer head with the brain in it. Other than that, there's only a couple of tools that you need and they're very simple. First thing you're gonna need is a knife. You're gonna need a hacksaw. It's completely optional, but you may want to have a blender. And a bucket that you're gonna to use to actually soak the hide in the tanning solution. Now, last but not least is the most important thing that you need, and that is safety equipment. While you're dealing with the brain hide, remember it is dead and decaying. So the risk of some kind of infection is relatively high, especially since you have a saw and a knife that you're gonna be working with. The last thing you wanna do while trying to create buckskin is give yourself an infection. So make sure that you have your gloves on I'm gonna be wearing some of these disposable gloves when I'm extracting the brain. And I also have a little bit more heavier duty gloves that I use when I'm actually working the hide into the solution. Make sure that you wear these, make sure that you're always washing your hands and you do not touch your face or put anything in your mouth under any circumstance while you're actually working on this because that's just gross. So let's go ahead and dive into this. Now the first thing I'm gonna do here is I'm actually essentially gonna wind up removing this scalp to expose the skull. And then it's gonna give me a good line that I can cut to get into the brain cavity. And there really is no, I guess, right way to do this. Everything is ish. And I usually just kind of start by going down the center here, pulling that up. You don't have to go. So I'm gonna put a line here, and then I'm just gonna create a fold or a flap on by its ear and again by its nose. And then that's gonna give me a good handle here that I can just kind of grab the skin and just remove it. It's gonna get in the way if you leave it there. Um, so I just kind of try to take it off. And I'm gonna leave that one ear there. Give me a uh, something to hold on to. Now, this is the hard part. And all I'm gonna be doing here is just essentially removing the scalp of the deer. And it could take a while and it's kind of a gross, squishy process. So allow me to give you the fast forwarded version. Now that we've removed the scalp, or the little piece of skull here, it exposes the brain cavity. And what we're gonna do now is go ahead and start essentially spooning some of that stuff out and sticking it into our blender. Now I'm always gonna be cautious about cross-contamination. And at this point on, I do not want to touch the outside 
of my blender. The outside is going to be the clean side, the inside, the dirty side. So I'm going to be very, very careful and mindful about that. Now that we got all of our brains into the blender, the last step here is just to add some warm water. And let's make a smoothie. Here's a pro tip here. Always look away when you start it up because even though you got a lid, stuff can go flying. Looks good enough for me. You want to see how it tastes? <laughs> Neither do I. I think we are ready, though, to get this sucker into a bucket and get our hide soaking. Into the bucket goes our tanning solution. And into that tanning solution goes our hide. So rather than dumping the entire hide in all at once, I'm really taking time to make sure that I'm putting it in in such a way that I get rid of any air bubbles. I want to make sure that all surfaces of this hide is touching the tanning solution. So I'm going to go ahead and do that and I'll show you what it looks like as soon as I'm done. So there is our hide in the brain tanning solution. And I took the opportunity to go ahead and stick my hands with the gloves on, of course, and really massage that hide in there and make sure that it really absorbs that solution. And I'm going to be back periodically throughout the night to do that. And um, hopefully we'll get ourselves a really soft and supple hide. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day three of our project on how to make buckskin. If you recall last night we made a brain tanning solution and we had our hide soak overnight in that solution to absorb all of that good fats which is going to give us a very pliable uh, buckskin at the end. What we need to do today is bring all of that tanning solution out a couple of times, have it re-soak back in the tanning solution again and that's really going to push and force all that tanning solution into all the fibers and all the pores and give us a very very soft final product. So this step requires just a couple of things but the good news is they're simple, they're easy to acquire and it's not a whole lot. Really all you need is just two poles. One of them is going to be your horizontal pole and this is where you're going to go ahead and drape over your buckskin. The other pole is going to serve as a windlass in which we're going to use to go ahead and wench down uh, and wring out all that tanning solution from the hide. So let's go ahead and get started with that. And all we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and drape our buckskin over the pole. Now because we want to save our tanning solution a little bit more, we're going to make sure that the bucket is positioned in a way to catch as much of that tanning solution as possible so we can reuse it once we're done with the first ringing. So now that we have our buckskin draped over our beam here, we're just going to go ahead and let it drip dry as much as possible before we actually start to wring it out. We are running against the clock here. It is starting to turn. Uh, as far as the weather goes and there is actually a winter weather storm coming in right now so hopefully we'll get this thing wrung out and soaking back in this tanning solution before the weather actually turns really bad. The drips here really began slowing down so we're going to take uh, the time and just kind of help it along make sure we can wind up working this hide and wringing it out. If you don't get as much as you can out of it before you start wringing it, it's gonna slip and slide all over. And uh, that's really gonna make things difficult and very messy. At this point, we've squeezed out as much tanning solution as we can. 
The next step is just to go ahead and lay it out and let it air dry a little bit so that way it's not a slippery mess when we try to wring it out. And right now, given our weather conditions, hopefully it does dry out enough. I'm going to let it sit here for a little bit. I'm going to go inside, get some coffee, and let my fingers warm up. Let's see what we can do about giving it its first ringing. First thing we need to do is make this into a donut. And to do that, you divide the hide into thirds. I have it folded over so one third is facing me and two thirds is facing the camera. And all we're gonna do here is fold it over so it's equally divided into thirds and we are gonna roll it up into a donut. And let's see, hopefully we can do that here. And it's, let's hope it's dry enough. The tighter you wind up rolling it, the less it's likely to slip on you. All right, so it's looking like the hide still wants to slip a little bit, but that's fine for its first ringing. Because I'm gonna get it back into the tanning solution and then we're gonna wind up bringing it out again. All right, I'm going to admit this isn't the best setup. The Native Americans would have this cross beam supported between two trees. Right now, this is slipping all over the place, but it is the only setup I have. So we're going to make it work. Anytime you wind up stretching your hide after wringing it out, it's kind of neat because you can see it change color. You can kind of see the translucent opaque here and you can see my green gloves. But when you start stretching that out, it'll actually start turning white. And that's really what gives that buckskin its character white color before you smoke it. After you smoke it, you get more of the brown, golden colors. But this is just gonna help make sure that it's flexible in all directions. And I think I'm going to go ahead and wring it out one more time, stretch it out, and then stick it back into its um, back into the bath, and we'll see what happens there. Now what we're left with is essentially a buckskin donut. I'm going to go ahead and open this up, stretch it out. I'm going to put it back into its tanning solution and it's going to sit overnight. And then we'll just kind of do the whole thing again tomorrow for the last time. The last thing I want to do before I take my hide and stick it back in the tanning bath is I want to go ahead and kind of give it a good stretch. Remember at this point we've pushed everything out of the hide. We've kind of closed off some of those fibers so the stretch helps it to open up and really absorb whatever's going to be left in that tanning bath. And to do that I have just something simple that I use for a stretching pole 
and this is nothing more than a piece of 4x1. Um, I think I pulled it off of a pallet and it's been profiled with kind of a blunt design here and I'm going to use this to stretch that hide bath. And you can have as much weight on this as you want and just kind of work it back and forth. Other people will have two, uh, they'll take two people, so a partner, and kind of just work the hide by tugging on it in multiple directions. Uh, if you don't have two people, this is a great way to do it. And it's kind of cool because... All right, at this point in the game, we have a hide that has been thoroughly stretched and is ready to go ahead and soak in its final bath. Now this is gonna go back into the tanning solution. It's gonna stay in there overnight. And tomorrow, we're gonna do the whole process over again, but it's going to be for the last time. So I'm gonna go ahead and put this in here. Again, trying to make sure that I get all the air bubbles out. I'm gonna work some of the solution back into the hide and I'm gonna be done for the night. We will see you all in the morning. Good evening everyone and welcome to day four on our project for tanning buckskin. If you haven't noticed, it's snowing and we are now deep in the clutches of winter. This winter storm has given us a very late start on today's project. I've had to dig myself out, dig my neighbors out and cut down some trees and it's just been a horrible mess. The good news is all we are doing today is the exact same thing we did yesterday. I'm going to go ahead and wring this out and give it a final good stretch before we move on to the softening process. And that is what we are going to do tomorrow. So I'm going to go ahead and spare you all the details since you've seen the nitty gritty on how to do that. And we will check in tomorrow when we start softening this hide. Step in making buckskin is known as softening and this is by far the most labor intensive step out of the entire process and essentially what that entails is a controlled drying of your hide removing that moisture in such a way that it doesn't allow for those fibers to harden and lock in you kind of want to get a little crust going on the outside layer, maybe on the edges, and break it up. Give it some good stretches, start working it back and forth between some sharp angles to really pull those fibers apart. Then you're going to go ahead and just kind of let it sit out, give it a little bit of a controlled drying, and repeat the process over and over again. And it's really not rocket science here. I mean, there is a a science to it you could take a piece that's super duper wet and you can work it back and forth and that's really not going to do anything because it's still wet you kind of want it to the point where it's just drying um, and some of the moisture has already been removed from it and a good tip is really the start at the edges because that's where the things are going to be the thinnest and that is where you're going to start having those those uh pieces of your hide dry out first and you're just going to go ahead and break up those fibers as it's drying and all I'm using here is nothing more than a profiled 4x1 and I am just going to go ahead and work those edges I'm going to stretch it over that pole I'm going to pinch it and I'm going to just pull on it I'm going to do this work my way around and I'm just gonna keep doing this until I feel that really I'm at a point that no matter how much more I do it nothing's gonna nothing's changing and at that point that means that I can take a break and monitor the hide for a little bit and just kinda see when I can come back when you start to get that little bit of crust and when things are starting to dry out um, 
maybe about 10, 15 minutes, depending on how warm it is or how much airflow is going around the hide. And uh, just keep working the process. Come back to it from time to time, give yourself a break, have a beer, and just keep working it. Now, as far as my stretching station goes, there are, there's a lot of different methods people use. Some people will take their hide and put it in a frame and they'll poke it with a stick. And that's fine, that works. Other people will suspend this um, over a cable and actually ring it on the cable. And I have a cable outside and we're going to do that from time to time. It's just really cold outside right now. It's hovering right about 20. I was outside skiing earlier today and it's, it's pretty cold. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and do that from time to time. But most of my work is going to be right here on my little stretching station. Aside from using my stretching pole, I'm going to actually use my knees here. And I'm going to take the hide, drape it over my knees, pull it down, and then actually just open my legs up to stretch it a little bit more. That's a method. The important thing is that as you stretch it, you want to go in opposite directions. You want to go parallel with the stretch. So I'm working it from the neck to the rump. And when I get done stretching it here, I'm just going to turn it around this way and just stretch it out side to side. And I might even go at diagonally here. This is a piece of cable I was talking about. It's 3 16 inch. And it's just connected from the base of this tree all the way up to that branch there. And this is a cable that I use to help me soften up this hide. Now, the edges here are starting to dry out so we're just going to go ahead and work those soften those up fluff them up a little bit the hide <laughs> starting to freeze a little out here in the cold so right we're just going to keep warm uh, working it then bring it back inside to warm let it dry a little bit more and come back out and do it all over again and what i have here is i have a rounded off scraper and it's bolted into this piece of four by one and all I'm going to do is I'm going to fix that to my stretching board using my super space age technology fastener here little C clamp so what this blade is essentially going to do is it is going to go ahead and replace the cable it is going to give me a sharp bend that I can use to work this hide and I typically don't like to do this method here because it can definitely go you can work it so vigorously that you'll wear a hole in your hide and not even know uh, but it is it is a method it will work and really anything that gives you that sharp bend to help break those fibers up that will definitely work i've seen video on youtube and i think the video was called tanning buckskin with the Cree and the Cree are a Native American uh, tribe out there in Canada and they used a steel ring that they got off of a wooden barrel and that was fixed to a tree and they just kind of worked it back and forth on that ring so it's the same process here it's just anything that gives you that sharp bend to help break those fibers up and loosen them up as they're drying that will definitely work so I'm going to give this a one pass and then I'm going to go ahead and stretch it over my knees and just let it dry a little bit and come back to it in 10 minutes. At this point, you just keep doing 
what you've already been doing. Keep stretching your hide, keep working it, keep cabling it, but make sure that you go ahead and give yourself a break and that you monitor your hide so that it does not dry out too fast. Here's a good tip for you. If you decide that you want to go ahead and take a break overnight or a long period of time, just fold your hide up, but make sure that the edges are on the inside folds and then stick it in a plastic bag. This keeps it from drying out too fast and allows your hands the time it needs to recuperate. All right, we're gonna fold this up, keep the edges inside so they don't dry out first. Stick it in a Ziploc bag and we'll come back to it later on when I get done helping my neighbor out. This way it doesn't get away from us and dry out too fast. And we'll come back and work it for an hour more or so, let it dry out a little bit more, and then wrap it back up, stick it in the fridge, tackle it again tomorrow. All right, guys. Getting a little bit of a crust layer here. I used to take sandpaper. I discovered that wasn't a good idea, and that the proper method, if you wanted to preserve the green side here, is actually use a pumice stone. And uh, this, I believe, is a composite one. It's not a natural one. And I just bought this from Walmart here, so break some of this crust up. And get back to work. It has taken a while to get here, but it is so worth it. Look at this beautiful piece of buckskin. And I know you can't feel it, but it is soft, it is supple, it is pliable. And I cannot wait to finish this up. The very next step is the smoking process. And that is where we wind up preserving the hide in its current condition. And it is very important before you get to the smoking process that you do not let this get wet at all. Because if it gets wet, then you go right back to step three, tanning and softening and all that hard work that you put into it was for nothing so make sure that you keep this dry i'm gonna go ahead and get ready for the smoking process and we will see you in a few thank you so much for watching please stay tuned to part two where we preserve our hide by smoking it if you've enjoyed this video please consider giving it a thumbs up or better yet, subscribe so you never miss any future episodes. And as always, I appreciate any comments you may have, tips and tricks on how to tan deer hides better the next time.